honored to welcome Ms. Delita Martin, whose artwork features the role of women in African-American culture. She uses drawing and printing to create works that reconstruct identity. Martin is currently the founding director of Black Box Press and a full-time artist. She has received numerous awards that include the Telly Award and the Emerging Voice Award for the Purdue University Alumni, where she received her Master's of Fine Arts degree in drawing and printing. Thank you for joining us. I'd like to thank you all for coming today to um, hear me talk about this work. Um, I'm going to start off by just kind of um, talking about how this particular series of work um, kind of got started. Um, I decided two years ago that I was going to uh, step down from teaching and I wanted to work as a full-time artist. So my husband was like, you know, we need to come up with a plan. I think you need to be in the studio and if it works, great. And if it doesn't, you'll have a really good story to tell. <laughs> so, so either way, you know, but you know, luckily for me, it kind of worked out, so I'm really excited about that. Well, when I left the university, um, I started kind of looking at my work and thinking about um, a new series of work, something that I really wanted to work on and what I wanted to do. And, you know, watching the news and watching TV, all these just, you know, there's so many horrible things that are happening today. I wanted to really focus on something positive, um, something positive in our communities and something that was very close to home. So I started thinking about the women that I grew up with in my community as well as in my family and the impact that they had on my life within the family structure as well as within the community structure. So I started thinking about you know, negative imagery that was out there. You know, you have the stereotypes of Mammy, Jezebel, and Sapphire. Um, Mammy's probably one of the most well-known of those stereotypes. And I really wanted to um, take that imagery and give a new narrative to it, which is what I do with my work, is basically reconstructing identity. And um, I felt it was important to um, look, again, look at the women within my community that was close to me. So I started working on a series called I Come From Women Who Could Fly. And that was a very important, um, it was very important to, to the, that the title convey how magical these women were in what they did in everyday life. Um, the stories that they told, um, the way they took care of the family, the way they took care of the community. And so I wanted to really highlight that in my work. So I started working um, on these works and I really wanted to challenge myself because I wanted to work larger and um, I wanted to really change the way I was working in the studio itself. So I'm a printmaker, which is what I primarily do, and I have, my background is in drawing, but I didn't want to focus on process, although there's like a million processes in these works itself, but I wanted to get into the studio, and it was about creating, about taking whatever knowledge in whatever area that I had and creating these works, and that's what I did. So if drawing worked, great. If painting worked, fantastic. If printmaking worked, even better. So I married all the processes that I had learned in school together in order to create these works. So that was the first um, challenge um, beyond size. This was the first piece um, the uh, Dream Keeper was the first piece in the series that I created, and this is an image based on my grandmother. Now, growing up, I, you know, there weren't any museums, there weren't any art schools, there wasn't any of that that I could really reference as a child. Um, I grew up in Conroe, Texas, a very small town, uh, predominantly white, and there wasn't any imagery that looked like me. And so I didn't really have a reference. So I had started trying to bring this imagery into my work. And, um, you know, there just, there just wasn't a lot of resources for me. Well, I, the way I grew up with my family, everybody could draw, everybody could paint. 
Um, there were woodworkers, uh, quilters, and oral storytellers. There were also writers, poets. Um, so creating was something that we did. It wasn't an emphasis on it. It wasn't um, you know, something that we really talked about. It was just something you did. It was like drinking a glass of water. You just did it. So, um, so that's, that's how I grew up creating. Well, at the age of 12, um, I think I was about 12 or 13 maybe, um, my father comes home and he says, get, your, get, get all your work together. And I put it in this really sad portfolio that I made out of two poster boards. And I took these drawings with me and we drove to Houston from Conroe about 45 minutes. And I met Dr. John T. Biggers. And my father studied under Dr. Biggers. And so he knew him, you know, they called him Doc. And so he gave me my first art critique. And I was absolutely in awe of this man. And when I saw his work and I saw the imagery that he was using, it gave me the validation that I needed in my work to continue to create my work. So I think at that very moment, I knew for sure that that's what I was going to do. So he looks at my work and I'm still, I'm standing there like, oh my God, John Biggers is looking at my work. And this is the only thing that's registering in my mind is Dr. Biggers is looking at my work. Dr. Biggers is looking at my work. Oh my God, oh my God, who can I tell? Who can I call? Who's gonna know what I'm talking about? But he said one thing to me that truly stuck out to me. And I've tried to bring that into the studio and it's always at the base and the foundation of all my work. He said, young lady, do not ever miss an opportunity to uplift your people through your work. And that is something that I've taken to heart and it is the foundation of all of my work in my studio. And this is what I've tried to do with the series, I Come From Women Who Could Fly. So my grandmother was a storyteller. Um, she was a quilt maker as well. And I can't sew, but I was in charge of cutting the pieces for her quilts. So she didn't use fabric um, that you go to the store and purchase. She used our old clothing, um, bed linens, bed sheets, whatever um, materials that we were no longer using. So I would cut it up into squares and she would have me fold them into like little triangle pieces and she would piece them together on larger squares and she called that her Rocky Mountain quilt. And we talked about what it would be like to be in the Rocky Mountains. She never traveled anywhere. We didn't have the means for that. But the idea that she would take me on these journeys in my mind and through her stories were absolutely amazing. And so we would do that at night and I wanted to I think she passed storytelling on to me, and I think she wanted me to carry on the tradition, and I had to do it my way, and my way is visually. So I started to sew in my work, and the sewing became very important because I wanted the viewer to be able to share the, that moment where she quilted with me and told me these stories. And, and that is why um, the sewing of the hair and the sewing of the clothing and all these works are sewn together because it's piecing together and that's what she calls sewing. Whenever she made quilts, she would call it piecing together. So this is my way of piecing together that history, that tradition, and those stories that she told me. And so when we weren't quilting together, the other thing that we would do is she loves stuff. So I think some of you that took the workshop from me this morning, you know, I'm a hoarder. I keep everything. I can't get rid of stuff. And, um, and I think I just grew up like that. Well, she would have jars, mason jars and um, Folgers coffee cans, she always kept them, and she would have things in them. There was buttons, there was pieces of fabric, there were old bottles of perfumes, there were tops, anything you could possibly think of were in these jars, and she would dump them out on her bed, and we would go through, and there was a story attached with every single piece. And she would repeat these stories to me over and over and over, and I never got tired of them. And so growing up, I began to associate objects with people, places, and things. So I started looking at my work, and I was like, wow, you know, I have these bowls that are appearing. I have these birds that are in the work. 
I have, you know, safety pins, jars. What is this saying to me? Well, this became my visual language. It became a language for me to use to talk about these women. So I began to take these objects and reassign their identity to them as well so that they can speak my language. And what I like about it, are these are common everyday objects that we see. A lot of them are domestic objects, but every single person in this audience has seen them before and has some sort of connection with them. So when you look at my work and you see a ball, it may not have the same meaning to you as it does to me, and I'm always happy to share my meaning and my story, but when you look at it and you're like, oh, wait, you know, I remember that style of bowl. I remember those mixing bowls, those yellow mixing bowls and, and things like that. The conversation starts. And that's what I like to bring to my work is this conversation that happens between the viewer and the work. So the bowl is a symbol that you'll see in my work. I use a lot of circles. The circles are symbols of the moon. The moon references the female. Um, the, the bowl references the female in that it's the wound. It's a vessel, just as the wound is a vessel. And so when I created this piece here, the bearer, I was thinking of this young woman as the bearer for the next generation that would carry it on, the person that would pick up and take it to the next generation. So I called her the bearer, and she has these, she's surrounded by bowls, these vessels. So you look at her, and I don't ever think of her as, um, a single image, I always think of her as a group with her ancestors, with the spirits around her as well. So those are the type of symbols that I use in my work as well. Um, the backgrounds uh, are printed. They're abstract in comparison to the images themselves. Well, that's because I like space. But when I think about space, I think about mental space, I think about emotional space, I think about psychological space, and I believe that when we walk into a room or we walk into a space and we feel a certain way, it's because of that fingerprint or that, that human, that humanness that's left behind in that space. And I think spaces um, sometimes shape us and we sometimes shape spaces. And so that is why when you look at the work and you begin to see the patterns come through or the background comes through, that's showing that connection between that person and that particular space. So all of these things um, come together to uh, help me to be able to tell the stories of these women and uh, create the series of work. So are there any questions or I may not be covering everything, but yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll pass it around. Is your work on paper or is it some other surface? Um, I work on paper. I love, I absolutely love paper. Um, the pattern pieces that you see are over the years, I've collected handmade paper and hand printed paper from all over the world. And I had no idea what I was gonna do with the paper. So I've had it for several years. And then when this series came about, it just kind of like, you know, it reminds me of fabric and I wanna sew with it. So I use, um, I think I was talking earlier, I use one stitch to sew the uh, paper or the fabric um, onto the piece. It's the only stitch that my grandmother taught me. I don't know what it's called. It's over under stitch. But that's very important to me because that's what she taught me to do. So I wanted, to, again, to be able to bring that to the work. But some of the, um, the prints are hand printed and, and others are, are handmade papers. Are some of them fabric also? Yes. Like, that looks like fabric. No, it isn't. Um, the works that are in this show are actually all paper. 
the works that are here. There are some pieces within the series that are that include fabric and paper together, and I really like the the combination of the two because you really kind of have a difficult time um, actually telling the difference. Um, I love visual texture as well. So when you're up on the piece, I like it when people come up to the work and actually look at the work because there's a lot of different things that are happening and that's going on. So when I talk about my work, I really like to talk about the pushing and the pulling of the mediums. You know, some areas fight each other and other areas marry together really well. So you have this conversation within the work that's happening that I really enjoy. You referred to these works as a series. Are there more? Yes. Tell us about those, please. <laughs> Um, the, series has, the series has begun with 14 pieces. They're all large scale works, so it's a continuing series that I'm working on. Um, I don't feel like all of the stories have been told. Um, the new, I guess, component to this uh, series is that I've actually began to record the stories and I am hand setting them in type and printing them as well. So there'll be somewhat of an art book component to them. But um, I just think that there's so many stories that um, my grandmother told me over the years that um, you know, I could spend a lifetime probably documenting them. And I think the wonderful part about the stories is that, you know, they have this element of, I like to refer to them as magical realism. You know, there's this story that's based in truth, but there's this fantastic element to it. And so I try to bring that to the work as much as possible. Um, the main story that's in the work itself is um, about a, a woman named, well, actually a young girl named Luna. And Luna lives in the moon. And Luna was this um, young girl who um, felt like she had two sisters, and she lived with her grandmother and her mother, and she felt like her sisters were more beautiful than she was. Well, within the African-American community, um, there you may have or may not have heard of people refer to individuals with darker complexions as maybe a blue-black. This person has a blue-black skin color. Well, Luna had that type of complexion, and she would go out at night, and she would play in the moonlight, and the moon would shine down on her, and she would have this beautiful blue cast to her skin, and the moon thought she was so beautiful that she asked Luna to come and live with her, and Luna does. And so from there, my grandmother took me on this journey. Every, there were all types of different stories, and you know, the phases of the moon was involved in these stories. So I just, so I, I feel the need to actually document these stories and continue on with the series and the work. Any other questions? Yes. Is it, is it charcoal or what is that? Um, the medium that I'm using uh, is gelatin printing for the backgrounds. Um, I did an uh, actual workshop this morning on gelatin printing, and I'm actually um, cooking Knox gelatin and making a surface out of that, and I print from that surface. I also use a gel plate, which you can actually buy from Dick Blick uh, or find it on Amazon, and I, and I use that as well. Um, stenciling, um, oil-based ink, uh, Conte, charcoal, um, acrylic paints, and hand stitching. So whatever I could pull out, I use, um, you know, so. Can you, sh oh, you have a question, okay. What is, I guess, this is a question more of a, maybe an observation because the women who made you fly, or made you, is that the reason that you chose that as your first piece and your grandmother with the bird? Okay, um, I could say yes, but uh, <laughs> it'd be done with it, but no. Um, to be honest with you, I like to work very intuitively with, um, 
my work. So by that I mean I'll start with a background. So usually when I start, I have a general idea in terms of color. Color, in my mind, is associated with emotions and feelings. So I'll start with that. And each layer that I add onto the work dictates what happens next. So once I get to the imagery itself, these women talk to me in my studio. It may sound really crazy, but they do. <laughs> and um, they tell me who they are. And they eventually tell me what's ha what their story is and what happens with them. So the symbols are probably the last thing that goes onto the work um, that I add into the piece. And I push and pull from there. But I like to work intuitively. I don't like to start. Um, with too much of a plan because I really want the work th it's when I'm in the studio for me to be honest with you it's like prayer um, there's a spiritual element that happens and when I walk outside of my studio and come back into my studio there's two totally different atmospheres that happen there's the reality and then there's that spiritual thing that's happening Um, so I have three questions, kind of, and you can do what you want. Um, one is, what have you learned about yourself through this work? And another one is, what have you learned about other people through this work? And how is this, um, how have you connected to the community through this work? That's a very good question. <laughs> Um, I have learned a lot about myself and I've learned a lot about um, the women that I was referencing in the work. Um, my mother is one of the figures that's kind of depicted throughout the work. Um, I used photographs for this work which was um, extremely important because I've never done that before. The work that I normally do um, are really just kind of made up not made up people, but they're a compilation of many people that I know. So you might see my mother's eyes, the lady down the street, you might see her lips or something like that. So it's really about this connection um, that we all have between us. For this particular work, I wanted the work to be very personal and I really wanted to focus on my story. And so I went home and I pulled photographs and I brought them back to the studio. Well, I'm not interested in portraits in the traditional sense. I am interested in capturing the spirit of an individual. Um, I, in undergrad, I had the opportunity to visit an artist's studio, um, well, actually her home. And she's a stained glass artist in Dallas, Texas. And she had a portrait that was done for her, or done of her, by Dr. Biggers. And you looked at the portrait, and it looked absolutely nothing like her. but you could instantly tell it was her and he captured her spirit and I knew that that's what I wanted to do. So from that respect, I am not a psychology major so I really don't know how this works, but I think I learned more about my mother working with this body of work than I knew before. There's a certain understanding that I have now that I didn't have before. You know, we probably all have little mother issues everywhere or <laughs> family issues, but some of those things have gone totally out the window, and I'm not really sure the psychology of how it works, but I learned um, a lot about myself and you know where I come from and why I maybe do the things that I do. So, so there was a learning process with this as well. So it was kind of therapeutic in a way. So we've been sort of learning the story of the travels for state of the art, and when the curators came to various studios, did, could you share, was it Chad or Don, and how did you bring them into your world and understanding of what you're doing? That's a good story. Um, well, first of all, I had no idea about the project itself. I was busy working on this body of work. I had this piece completed and maybe a half a piece done. And I received an email from Chad and he wanted to know if he could come for a studio visit. And I said, sure. 
And I knew who he was, and you know, he was affiliated with the museum, but I, again, I didn't know anything about the project that was going on. So I was like, sure. So he comes in and he says, well, um, you know, is it okay if I video? And I was like, sure, go ahead. So we talked, and we didn't really necessarily um, talk about this work in particular, but I did talk about my process as well. So he left, and I was like, great conversation. So a few months later, I um, was watching television late one evening, and my phone kind of vibrates, and I get an email, and then I started getting text messages that was like, congratulations on the Huffington Post interview. And I was like, what? So I quickly Googled myself, Delito Martin Huffington Post, <laughs> And I said, oh my God, this is the, the, the interview with Chad. And I was like, I called my husband. And it was at that point that I actually went online and started kind of Googling and found out about the project. And I was like, you don't think. And he was like, well, I don't think they would have put it on, you know, the internet if, it, if you weren't going to be included. I was like, well, are you sure? I was like, well, I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm just going to block it out of my mind just in case it's not true. So I tried to, and um, I eventually got another email. Well, it was interesting because the email was like, hopefully we would like for you to participate. Um, it was very, you know, not very direct, I should say. So I'm like, well, do you think? And he was like, I think you're in. I was like, well, I'm not going to say anything because I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure. So... Um, they came out to do a second interview, and the uh, young lady was like, so how does it feel to be included in the exhibition? And I was like, oh, now that you've told me, it feels great. You know? <laughs> so, I, so I honestly, you know, I'm hanging on to these emails where they're like potentially included in the exhibition, um, hopefully included in the exhibition. So I wasn't really sure, you know, I didn't want to assume anything. So that's kind of how it, um, you know, came about. And so it was like, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, so that was really awesome. Are there any other questions? Well, uh, again, it was so wonderful that Delita came here and she has been so busy with the teacher development program and giving an art talk. She came in earlier on Friday to prep for the workshop. And come up here so everyone can see you in the light. <laughs> Uh, and she's going to stick around for a few more minutes if you'd like to speak with her in person or just, you know, let her know how you feel about her paintings. Please do. And again, thank you, Delita. Thanks for coming.